Ben Suttles, going, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invite. Hopefully I can add some value to everybody listening today. Yes, multifamily investing is such a hot topic. And um, Ben Suttles is, well, all of these have been hot topics, but especially I hear a lot of people wanting to get into multifamily. Um, and we have Ben Settles and just a little bit about him. He's going to be talking about multifamily investing from zero to 3,000 units. Uh, ben is the co-founder of Disrupt Equity, a private equity firm specializing in multifamily real estate um, throughout Texas, Georgia, and Florida. So over the last 10 years, he has been involved in the acquisition and management of over 3,000 plus units and currently has over 250 million in assets under management. So we have a lot to learn from you. Thank you so much for joining us and take it away. All right. Well, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Hopefully I can add some value today. We're going to be talking about multifamily investing. So I'm just going to dive right into my presentation here. So as Jamie had mentioned, I'm Ben Suttles, co-founder of Disrupt Equity. We're based in Houston, Texas. We invest throughout the Sun Belt. We love Texas. We love Georgia. We love Florida. Who doesn't like the Carolinas as well? But, uh, you know, we're trying not to spread ourselves too thin, right? So, you know, this is going to be a little bit about my journey from uh, owning no doors to owning over 3,000 at this point, right? And, uh, you know, a little bit of progression and a little bit of ways that maybe you can get into it. I know that it is a hot topic. It's been a hot topic for... You know, I remember they were calling the peak in 2014 whenever I got in. And I'm glad I didn't listen to anybody because if I had, I wouldn't have bought anything because everybody was calling the top and everybody continues to call the top. And I see multifamily as having nothing but legs for the next 10 to 20 years. So let's dive right into this. <clears throat> I have to have the disclaimer, folks. I'm sorry. Yes, I know my, my lawyer will get on to me if I don't. So ultimately, this is just for informational purposes only. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the information to my best of my knowledge. Please consult your legal, tax, financial advisor, your professional advisors, anybody that you trust before you do any level of investing. I am not going to be selling anything today. I'm just going to be kind of generally just providing some good information, some content, some education so you guys can go out and do some more research on your own. So who is this guy? Well, I'm the bald guy right there in the middle. Ben Suttles, managing partner. Jamie did a great job of introducing me. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit more of a background. So I came from the IT side, um, as I always kind of tell the story of uh, Ferris Musa, who's my business partner at Disrupt Equity. Hey, Ben, Ben, I, I just want to chime in real quick. Um, yep. I, I think I, I see you sharing your screen, um, but if you're clicking through slides, we're, we're not getting that. There you there go. We go. You're Does in. that look better? Yes. No. All right. Yours. Sorry, everybody. So I'm going to, th this is actually a great segue, right? Because people are always like, oh, he's, he was in IT. Well, Folks, as you can see, I'm not very technically savvy. You know, I was the guy on the, you know, on the other side of the table telling people how much stuff cost and what kind of colors you could get it in. So I was on the sales and business development side of IT. Um, you know, it was was it was a great industry to be in. I learned a lot. I did a lot of presentations. I did a lot of networking. You know, I had to go to a lot of conferences. And as anybody kind of knows, you know, within the real estate business, you have to do a lot of that same stuff. You know, and then I ultimately ended up finding syndication and raising equity and it was was really, you know, in line with the skill set that I had learned the previous 15 years in IT. So, you know, but ultimately, I don't consider myself an investor. I consider myself an entrepreneur. You know, I've started several businesses, Disrupt Equity just being one of them. Since we started Disrupt Equity, we saw, we've, we've started several other ones. You know, currently annual revenues of about 40 million across our whole portfolio of companies. And, you know, we, we're really excited about the acquisition part of our business. That's really where I get excited because, you know, anybody that's been a salesperson, you get that drive whenever you sell something. I get that same drive whenever I buy something here in multifamily. So we're going to hop right into this. So what does he do? Well, in a nutshell, we help investors achieve strong passive income by leveraging multifamily syndications. And what are syndications, you're probably asking? It's essentially where we pull people's money together to go buy bigger and better properties. Right. So I'll, I'll equate it back. You know, we're obviously talking about some single family stuff today, too. If you've got one hundred thousand dollars to invest, right, you could probably invest into a four hundred thousand dollar house. Right. Twenty five percent down. Now, what if you had 10 other friends that had one hundred thousand dollars to invest? Now you have a million dollars that you've pulled together right now. You can go buy a four million dollar property. Right. So it allows you to leverage other people's money to go buy bigger and better things. 
right? And that's essentially what syndication is, is the most simplistic way I've, I've been able to describe it over the years. There's ultimately some nuances to it. You have to follow sp specific laws and rules and regulations that are all regulated by the SEC. But in a nutshell, that is what syndication is. And that's what allows us to buy these bigger properties that are worth tens of millions of dollars, right? So as Jamie had mentioned, right, we're a vertically integrated private equity firm that has over more than 350 million in real estate, has gone full cycle on many large apartment deals, averaging 20 to 100 percent average annualized return. Right. So, you know, we've had a couple of deals that have approached 100 percent average annualized. That means 100 percent a year, folks. You know, now I'm not saying that every single one of those. Right. Not past performance doesn't indicate, you know, future performance. I got to put that out there. But it's possible with doing multifamily, it's possible to do it through syndication, right? So to date, you know, we own over 3,000 units across Texas and Georgia. We love Florida as well. We're currently trying to find our first deal out there. So here's a little bit of a track record. Why are you listening to me? Why is this guy even up here? Why did Jamie and Chris actually ask this guy to talk? Um, it's because we've been doing this for a while. We do have a track record, right? This is just a, a snippet of some of the deals that we've sold, some of the returns that we've provided. Um, you know, and ultimately all this stuff's on our website as well. You can, you can validate that and check us out. So meeting agenda, why multifamily? Three ways to get into multifamily. Where do you get started? Due diligence as a passive investor, red flags and multifamily offerings and case study walkthrough and open Q and A. All right. So we got a lot to talk about here. So why invest in multifamily real estate? So bottom line, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Everybody loves that. That's why we get into investing, right? You know. It's monthly distributions. We're also able to take advantage of some very, I'd say some cool tax advantages that really are, are boosted by being in commercial real estate. Cost segregation is not something that's necessarily married to commercial real estate, but when you have a single family rental, sometimes the cost of doing a cost segregation study isn't really warranted because they typically cost you one to $5,000. And you're asking, what is a cost segregation study? Well, it's essentially a study that's done you know, it's a, it's a combination of engineering and accounting that essentially allows you to depreciate things within that property at an accelerated rate, right? So uh, typically, I think it's 27 and a half years that you could depreciate certain things over the course of a, a property. You can bow wave that up to sometimes taking 100% of it in year one, or sometimes, you know, there's a 60% in year one and 40% in year two, right? Again, I'm not a CPA, so I don't know all the intricacies of it, but it helps offset some of that passive income that uh, our investors might have gotten. The other thing too is, and again, you could do this in single family as well, is 1031 exchanges are huge you know, within commercial real estate as well as multifamily. You've got forced market appreciation, right? You know, now market appreciation is more of a single family thing, right? The comps you know, in this specific subdivision are going up. They just built an HEB outside the, no, the neighborhood. So therefore it's more you know, um, popular of a place to live, right? Families want to move there, right? We can also force appreciation within multifamily as well, right? And what does forced appreciation mean? That essentially the way that commercial real estate is valued, folks, is based on the profitability of the, the property itself, right? So the more profitable I make it, then you divide it by a cap rate, the value is going to increase. So if I come in and I update all the interiors and I paint the outside and now I can charge more in rent. Guess what? The profitability of the property just went up, right? So I was able to force that. Now there's still some market things that drive cap rates, which is the way that things are, are typically valued in order to kind of you know, have an apples to apples comparison between various properties. But most of what you're doing is you're forcing appreciation and that's where you're going to drive the tremendous amount of value in. So again, tax benefits and depreciation, great debt, you know, multifamily it, out of all commercial real estate gets the best debt. And I'm not just saying that it's not just because we're in multifamily. It's just true. Right. The reason being is there's an affordability problem in this in this um, country and the federal government is our biggest partner in a lot of these deals. Right. Fannie and Freddie, I'm sure a lot of people probably heard those names. They are the biggest backers of multifamily in the whole entire country. They were built their whole edict is to provide affordable housing lending to the market and make sure that the market can continue to do that. So they provide great debt in terms of great leverage, right? Sometimes you get up to 80% loan to cost, right? You're going to get great interest rates. We're locking in interest rates that are in some cases sub three on a commercial real estate property. That's $40 million, folks. I mean, 
You just have never seen anything like it. And it's gotten even better over the last couple of years, right? Leverage. Again, you can get up to 80%. Sometimes on certain specific products, you could go up to 85. So you get great leverage, unlike say an office or a retail center where you might only be able to get 65 or 70% leverage, right? We also get longer terms on our loans as well, right? Again, commercial real estate loans typically are five to seven years, maybe 10 if you're lucky, right? 10 is usually the middle ground for, for multifamily. You're going to get anywhere from 7 to 15 on a fixed rate, long-term debt. And so you can really lock it in. In fact, I've seen some that have been as long as 20. And again, amortized over 30 years, folks. Not 20, not 25. This is 30. Um, scalability, right? Again, this is you're buying units all in one area. You can bolt them on with other properties in that area as well. You can bring in third-party property management that will allow you to allow them to go do the heavy lifting, do the boots on the ground, collect the rents, do the work orders, you know, field those tenant problems while, allow, while allowing you and your team to go out and find another deal, right? So it's scalable in a way that I always struggled with on the single family side. And again, we love single family. Both me and Ferris started there. I had plenty of rentals. I did flips. I did wholesaling. Did the whole gambit. Um, I just felt like this was a more scalable thing uh, moving forward, and was more conducive to to kind of you know my background in IT sales. So the three main ways to get into multifamily: investing passively into a deal, and we'll get into what that is. Adding value to get into a deal as a GP, right, as a manager of the deal, or doing your own deal. You know, we come across a lot of people that do their own stuff. Right. You know, and, and I'm not here to say syndication is the only way to do it. We know people that are wildly successful kind of doing it on their own. There's disadvantages and advantages to both. And we'll kind of get into that here in a minute. So option one, investing passively. So you're purely passive. We expect from our investors no more than filling out and signing four pieces of paperwork, submitting that is over for review. If all looks good, we give you the wiring instructions, you wire in your money. And that's essentially all you have to do now. We would love for you to review the monthly financials. We'd love to hear from you from time to time. You're allowed to ask questions, but there's literally investors that I've had for four or five years that I've never heard from, and they're completely happy because at the end of the day, they got into it because they wanted to be passive. They didn't want to have to deal with the stuff that we deal with on a daily basis. They just want their mailbox money. And I call it mailbox money, even though nobody does checks anymore. It's all ACHs. Um, you know, so maybe it's email money. I don't know. But you get my point. Right. So it's purely passive. The beauty of the partnership is you know, the passive investors still enjoy the, the pass through tax benefits. Right. So those cost segregation studies that are going to provide a tremendous amount of depreciation. Right. As a passive investor, you get the pro rata share of that. Right. So that's huge. The managers do all the work. I got to do all the work. You as a passive investor don't have to do anything. Again, you have to fill out four pieces of paperwork, sign them, send in your wire, and that's it. You sit back and you get paid. So when do you potentially get involved? And this is potentially, I'm putting that in quotations, to fire someone. You know, you say, hey, Ben, I don't really like that guy. He's not doing a great job. You're going to get a quorum of the other investors um, and you can oust me as the manager. Yes, that does happen. That's in all of everybody's paperwork. Hopefully that never happens to me. <laughs> it has not happened to me before, but that'd be one reason why you would get involved. Another one would be, hey, you know, we want to take a vote on should we refinance or should we sell? You know, these are big, there's tax consequences. And also the other thing that I'd add in here too is, should we do a 1031, right? Now, um, that's not always in everybody's paperwork, but sometimes that is. And it's important that you participate because ultimately it's your investment too. You are a partner in the LLC that then therefore owns the property. You know, that's what you're investing in. You're investing in an LLC that owns real estate, right? The process of passive, of being a passive investor, find and vet sponsors. You got to find people that are doing deals. You got to analyze the deal. You know, don't just take my word for it. Go out and crush the numbers. If you ever want to see the financials and, you know, determine what, you know, if you think that it's a good deal, you're going to underwrite it yourself and you're going to analyze that deal. You should go out and do it. And we're never shy about providing that information. And anybody that is, you should you know, think twice about investing with them. Complete that paperwork. And I'll admit it's like watching paint dry. It's about 127 pages of a PPM, an operating agreement a subscription agreement and a company agreement. But at the end of the day, it's worth it. You need to understand it. There is a level of risk. You could lose all your money. You know, there's all kinds of different things that have to happen. So you need to understand that paperwork. You should go through that with your financial advisor and or your legal team as well. 
wire those funds, monitor the deal and get your distributions. That's it. That's all you got to do as a passive investor. So what is the syndication model? What, is, what, what all do we do? And, and you know, how do we get compensated, right? So the sponsor finds the deal. We coordinate all aspects of the closing, right? We are putting, we're getting the loan in place. We are raising all the money. We are going through all the legal paperwork. We are negotiating the contract with the seller, the whole gamut, A to Z. That's what the sponsors are doing, right? Sponsors manage all operational aspects of the deal as well. So everything that's happening at the property level, you know, we are handling that. So again, passives can take a back seat and they can just enjoy those distributions. Then we essentially position the property to sell when we feel like it's a good time in the market to sell that property, right? We're not greedy guys. We're very opportunistic um, buyers and sellers. So if we see um, a run up in market prices in that neighborhood or in that sub market or in that area, or just in the nation in general, which is what's happening right now, we're going to sell. That's why we sold six deals in 2021 because it was the right time to sell. All right. Option number two, adding value to get into a multifamily deal. So this is somebody that, hey, I don't have any experience, but I want to do multifamily and I want to be on your side of the, the table, Ben. What can you do to potentially get into a deal quickly, right? Here's some, op some opportunities or some options for you. Ultimately, this is not an end-all, be-all list. There's plenty of ways to add value beyond this too, but these are probably the main ones. You got to find the deal, right? Go out and hustle a deal up, right? Who doesn't like a deal, especially right now? Underwrite the deal. You know, maybe uh, you're partnered with somebody that doesn't really like spreadsheets, doesn't know anything about Excel, doesn't even know how to open Excel. Um, you know, but you you are a wizard at that, right? That adds value to somebody. Maybe you can get into a deal doing that. Raising capital, right? Equity is needed to get into these deals. Now, there's ultimately a way that you need to do that and structure that. But, you know, raising capital is one way to get into a deal. Boots on the ground. We don't just invest here in Houston where we're located at. We invest nationwide. So there's been specific examples in the past where we've had people that have been boots on the ground in specific markets that we wanted to invest in and we've partnered with them, right? Because they're there to more closely monitor that asset or monitor that construction that might be happening. And that's worth something to us. Signing on the loan. Now this is non-recourse loans that we're, we're putting onto these, these properties, right? But there still needs to be the net worth, the liquidity and the experience piece that the bank is expecting um, of the people that are gonna be signing on the loan, right? And you're gonna ask, well, what's the net worth liquidity? Typically, you're going to get a $10 million loan. The net worth of the whole entire GP needs to equate to that. Liquidity tends to be 10 to 20% of the loan amount. So if you get a $10 million loan, you need to have liquid assets of $1 to $2 million and an experience, right? You could be worth $100 million bucks. Well, then maybe that's, a, that's, a, that's probably a bad example. Let's just say you're worth 10 and you're getting a loan worth 10, right? But you've never done a commercial real estate project in your life. The lender's probably still going to ask you to partner with somebody that's done this stuff before. Again, this is a complicated transaction. That's why it's so lucrative. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So the, the lender in a lot of ways is looking like, who on this team can execute this business plan and pull this off, right? So asset management as well, right? You know, now asset management is just kind of, you are managing the property management company, and that's important. Uh, property management, again, boots on the ground. You know, they are the ones that are butts on the line, collecting rents, doing work orders, the whole shebang, right? Uh, and then construction management, right? You know, there's a fair amount of rehab that has to go into these, you know, and instead, you know, like a single family, maybe you're doing 10 to, you know, $50,000 in rehab, maybe a little bit more, just depends, right? I'm doing two, three, $4 million rehab projects. These are major, there's major scopes on these. There's major amounts of money that are being shuffled back and forth. There's a lot going on. So construction management is another way that you could add value. It's all about leverage though, folks. You're leveraging the great debt that you have. You're leveraging the equity of you and the people that you're pulling money together. You're leveraging time, right? Maybe you're still doing your W-2, but maybe you've got some money in the bank. And so you're going to have that young buck that maybe has more time than you go out and find you a deal, right? You're leveraging his time, right? You're leveraging experience. Maybe you partner with somebody, you, you're bringing something to the table, but they've got the experience because they've been out there doing it. You're leveraging that, right? And you're leveraging contacts. You know, at the end of the day, real estate is a, you know, um, in a lot of ways, it's just about relationships as much as it is about uh, data and point, excuse me, data points and numbers and underwriting. And so you really need to leverage those people's contacts 
um, you know, and leverage those relationships to get ahead uh, more quickly, right? So now you say, well, I don't really want to do any of that stuff. Passive investing, that didn't sound like something I want to do. And I certainly don't want to, you know, be partnered with three or four other people, but I want to buy my own deal. All right, let's do it, right? So what area do you want to buy it in? What size do you want it to be, right? What returns do you want to have? What condition? Who's on the team, right? You can't do it all on your own, right? You might not want to partner with anybody. Maybe you wanted to buy it all on your own, but guess what? You still need a general contractor. You still need a property management company. You still need a title company. You still need a lawyer. You still need all of these things, right? You know, and at the end of the day, that's going to, you know, ultimately, you know, are you going to be successful or not, right? So you need to have a team. Deal flow. How are you going to look at deals, right? You're going to have those broker relationships. You're going to have those agent relationships. And, and just so everybody knows in commercial, for whatever reason, real estate agents are all called brokers, but they're the same damn thing. It's they're an agent. They took the same test, but for whatever reason, they just call them different in, in commercial. And do you have the time? You know, a lot of people want to do their own deal, but at the end of the day, do they have enough time to pull this off? Because guess what? Once you get that thing under contract, the clock is ticking, right? You've got to arrange the debt, which is the loan from the lender. You've got to make sure you have enough money to buy the thing. You've got to set up all the paperwork. You got to work with your title company. You got to get your insurance in place, just like we were talking about on the last episode, right? You got to get your property management company in place, right? Because this is all a timeline that has to happen within 30, 60 days of getting something under contract. A lot needs to happen. So make sure that you have the time to pull that off. Because yes, is it nice to have a bigger piece of a, your own pie? Maybe. I'd probably still question that statement, but in a lot of people's mind, it is. But you also have to take into consideration if you've got a W-2, I'll, I'll use an extreme example. If you're a doctor and you're working 60, 70 hours a week, you can't do this. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's just not possible because there's this is a full-time job. When you go buy an apartment complex, you're buying a business first and foremost. There's employees, there's vendors, there's payroll, there's everything in between the sun that you have to take care of. And that stuff takes time. So take into consideration, what are you currently doing? What does your team look like? And can you ultimately pull this off? Even if you have the money in the bank, and you have the biggest desire to go buy your own deal. You should still question, should I do it on my own, right? So how do you begin to growing towards those 3,000 units? Get yourself educated and get your financial house in order, right? You know, at the end of the day, the first thing that these lenders are asking for is give me your personal financial statement. Give me your bank statements. I want to verify, you know, just, you know, what, are, what credit worthiness are you, what state of credit worthiness are you in, right? But before that, you need to educate yourself on what is multifamily, what is syndication, what are the markets that I want to be in, and you need to understand what you're getting yourself into because there is a tremendous amount of risk. Again, a lot of reward that can be coming out of this, but there's still a lot of risk too, right? Define define that investment criteria, right? You know, you need to understand. Hey, I want to buy, you know, 50 units in Houston, then they need to be Class A, you know, uh, you know, style, which means that they're fairly new. And I want to buy it in this submarket, right? That's important to know. Um, you know, you need to define that because that's going to determine, you know, hey, which which direction do I start off going and walking in? A network with potential partners, operators, and brokers, right? You know, I know that obviously with COVID, networking has been a little bit of a challenge. There's a lot of things online, right? But these types of events that we're even on right now, this is a great opportunity for you to network and meet people that are in the business. And, you know, there's still a plenty of stuff you know, depending on what location you're in throughout the country, there's probably still some stuff that's starting to open up in, in in-person networking because at the end of the day, it's just as much a relationship business as it is a numbers game, right? Make offers or invest in your first deal as a passive investor. Take action. You know, people have this analysis paralysis because they look at these big numbers and like, oh, well, you know, if I screw this up, it's going to be, you know, life-changing, you know, uh, for the worst, right? I get that. You got to obviously do your amount of due diligence, do some vetting of the sponsor. If you're investing passively, you need to do some of that research. But I'm telling you, folks, I've seen more people not do deals because they have analysis paralysis than anything else. So at the end of the day, take a you know page out of Tony Robbins, right? Ready, fire, aim. Just get out there and take some action, right? Make those offers, invest in that first deal. You'll be able to course correct along the way. Trust me. Boom. I got through that pretty quick. So we'll do a little bit of Q&A, but if you want to get in touch with me, Ben Suttles, 
Ben at disruptequity.com. You know, um, hopefully I got through enough time there, Chris and Jamie. I don't know if I, if we do have enough time for Q and A, but happy to do it if we do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe stop the screen share on your end. It, it cut your your live feed. Uh, I see a little avatar for you. Oh. Let's see if you come back live here. Um, well, while you work on that, so um, one question we got up, um, Kevin Foster. There you are. There you are. All um, right. Kevin asked, "What well, what's the minimum in investing? So uh, folks that want to get involved passively, uh, what's the minimum that you're typically seeing? Um, it, I it, know it, it ranges. Depending on it does range. range. It does range. And I think it depends on the size of the deal, right? And the reason that that, that changes depending on the size of the deal is because people don't want to have a thousand investors on the deal, right? Yeah. You know, but I've seen it typically it's going to be between the $25,000 and the $100,000 range. Yeah. Is typically where it's going to be at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is there an app? Um, is there an average that you feel you know would be fair? 50, 50K. fifty k. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing mm -hmm. that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Derek, Derek had a question too. Um, will you uh, let? You know, do you take yes. investors who have Absolutely. SDI rates? Yes, yes, yeah. We have great relationships with New View, Quest, you know, Equity Trust, all the big ones. Um, this is one of the reasons why I love self directed IRAs too. I have my own. Um, you can obviously invest in commercial projects through this, right? So check it out. There's obviously some mechanics and some paperwork, but yes, we do accept those into our offerings as well. Awesome. Last question. Um, man, you really sparked up the questions here. So thanks everyone. Um, do you work with sophisticated investors or basically these opportunities? What's the type of investor that can get involved? Not so the and it depends. We don't have time to go into the types and what these yeah. mean, but you have non-accredited, sophisticated, and accredited. If you don't know what these mean, just Google them. But for those that do, at least right now, um, you know what type of investors can invest? Both, both, right? I think, it, and it's it will be clearly defined on the offering if it's just a first sophisticated and accredited, or if it's just for accredited, right? You know, and there's a difference. Everybody look up 506B offerings versus 506C offerings, and you'll get a lot of distinction between the two and 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 what the differences are. Yeah. Love it. Um, yep. Well, it's been awesome seeing y'all grow and, uh, and actually uh, collaborate with y'all in, um, you know, local events and yeah, you know, looking at absolutely. opportunities together. So uh, I know I, I know people got a lot of value out of it, and I certainly did. So appreciate yeah. it. Give, um, appreciate give you guys. You know, hopefully I gave some value back to everybody. I know that that was pretty quick. I was moving pretty fast. <laughs> but check us out. You know, we obviously put a lot of content out there, and I love talking shop. So if you guys ever have any questions, just reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. All right. Thanks. Appreciate you.